I'm Maureen Bellatori, and this is Spilled Salt, a podcast on the thrills and spills from the food, beverage, and agriculture industries. Today's guest is Matt Schrader, Director of Operational Winemaking at E&J Gallo Winery. Canandaigua Winery is the location that um, Matt works from. They also have some West Coast operation. So today's conversation is focused on a number of different aspects of the wine industry in um, in general, as it relates to East Coast winemaking, some New York State and um, Pennsylvania State growers um, of grapes, and how Matt works with the growers um, in the region, as well as kind of leaning into an understanding of what the consumers are looking for to create new wines. And what I love about um, Matt's work is that ENJ Gallo really focuses on what Matt calls making new friends for wine. So they're in the popular wine category, $12 and under a bottle. Um, And so it's just a really interesting perspective, especially as it relates to some of the other conversations we've had with other folks in the wine industry that are making a very different um, kind of bottle of wine for the industry. Enjoy the conversation. Thanks for joining me today. I'm so excited to have you talk through your work a little bit and your history and kind of some, the future and everything in between. So I'd love for you to start with a little bit of your background. You've been 20 years at Canandaigua Winery. That's a really long time. So start me at the beginning, right up to the work that you're doing now. Yeah, sure. Of course. Uh, so uh, I stayed local for college. I actually went to Cuba College. Uh, where I got a bachelor's degree in biology. Okay. Um, but my heart has always been microbiology. Uh, mm-hmm. Loved micro, took as many micro courses as I could. Um, just that's where uh, kind of my passion fell. Mm-hmm. So I, I graduated, I got my degree, uh, started looking around for jobs like people normally do. And I actually ended up uh, at Geneva General as a medical technologist. Oh, really? Yeah. So. I did, did it all. So to <laughs> say, um, really wanted to kind of stay in, stay in micro, but there wasn't a clear path for me there. Mm. Uh, there were two long tenured micro techs uh, that were doing fantastic work. Mm-hmm. So uh, back when you could peruse job ads in the paper, mm-hmm. uh, a fellow tech reached out and said, hey, Candigle Wine's looking for a wine microbiologist, you should apply. Mm. So uh, I applied. I got the job. Uh, day one, I kind of walked in uh, overseeing the micro lab, and they said, oh, by the way, you're also our assistant winemaker. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was a big surprise, uh, but background in biology, uh, I kind of dove, dove in both feet, um, started reading everything I could about winemaking, principles and practices of winemaking, wine microbiology, and a lot of on-the-job training. Mm -hmm. And before you continue from there, Matt, help help me understand, help our listeners understand, what exactly is microbiology? Sure. (laughs) So uh, microbiology is uh, the study of fungi, uh, bacteria, uh, viruses, anything you can't see with the naked eye. So... um, for the winery, it's uh, mostly making sure that you're done with fermentation because yeast uh, consume sugar and uh, their outputs are CO2 and alcohol. So mm-hmm. we're trying to make sure that our finished wines are uh, free of any yeast and free of any spoilage bacteria that may make the wine go bad or taste bad. So gotcha. that was my primary focus uh, coming into wine microbiology. It was, it was a nice trade-up. Because I went from bugs that could potentially make you sick or kill you to bugs that basically got you drunk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that's that's definitely a trade-up. Well done. Yeah. So uh, just kind of back to, you know, Mike um, starting at the winery. Yep. Uh, was an assistant wine, winemaker for quite some time. Uh, at the time, Candigua Winery was owned by Constellation. And we had a sister site. Uh, in Naples, Widmer Wine Cellars. So uh, after three years here, I went down to Widmer, 
-hmm. learned a new style of winemaking um, under Glenn Curtis. So a little more traditional winemaking, small lot, barrels, but um, great experience. Then mm -hmm. in 2010, I was able to come back to Canandaigua um, and been here ever since. So. Yeah. And so it's, it's quite a journey to go from sort of self-teaching, right? Yeah. <laughs> on Winemaking to the work that you're doing now. So talk a little bit about that. What is, what is the, the context of the work that you're doing now? Sure. So, um, like I said, a lot of on the job training, basic winemaking technique. Uh, when I went down to Widmer, uh, my boss said, hey, you should do the distance course through UC Davis mm -hmm. in enology and viticulture, uh, just simply because the Cornell program wasn't up and running yet. Mm, um, okay. So uh, that actually worked out really well. So continued some education there. Um, then being a young winemaker, uh, they sent me on a winemaking exchange program to Australia. Oh, so cool. I to a harvest in South Australia, which was eye opening and, you know, getting to meet with different winemakers, learn different techniques. So, really, kind of my first few years were a crash course that were really guided by uh, great teachers in the industry. Mm -hmm. So, to now, um, Recently, uh, I was, was promoted to director of operational winemaking. So now I kind of own the process, grape to, grape to bottle. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, grow relations, a team of six winemakers, um, all of the seller ops teams and the sanitation teams. So definitely yeah. a shift from tactical execution to more strategy base. Mm, gotcha. And I love that word strategy. So talk a little bit more about that. What does that mean for you? Like, how are you adding strategy into the winemaking process for what you're doing there? Uh, so luckily, luckily, um, luckily, uh, my current uh, winemaking boss uh, is on the West Coast, uh, but he is familiar with East Coast winemaking. Mm -hmm. um, and the varieties that are grown in New York and on the East Coast. Uh, so really the push has been for developing regional wines. So wines that will thrive New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, kind of general Northeast area. So he's given us quite the ability to advocate for ourselves. So when I'm looking at strategy, I'm looking on the grower relations side Hey, what varieties are out there and are planted and can support a new brand mm -hmm. uh, to, okay, if we bring this in, do I have the tanks, the cooperage? Do I have the equipment to process this, to, to make a quality wine? Mm -hmm. so, and then just really trying to drive where the Candagua goes in the future. And it's all very exciting. Mm -hmm. And so you spoke to East Coast winemaking compared to West Coast winemaking. What's the difference? So uh, I can only speak for my experience. <laughs> sure. So Canandaigua uh, Winery focuses on the popular category. So popular wine segment is $12 and under. So we are working with a lot of native and uh, hybrid varieties like Concord and uh, Cuga Whites. So, uh, <laughs> more Vitus Labrusca, which is distinctly different than Vitus Vinifera, like your Rieslings and mm -hmm. your Cabernet Sauvignons. So uh, it's a different set of winemaking uh, tools in the toolbox because our consumers want the bottle of Taylor Port that they buy today. Mm -hmm. tastes like the bottle of Taylor Port that they bought six months ago. Mm -hmm. so, right. Whether it was a great vintage, a poor vintage, uh, we don't have the luxury of relying on vintage to vintage variation. Mm -hmm. We have to make the wine taste the same, no matter what the growing year gave us. Mm -hmm. so, and so I know that there's a lot of variation in the grapes that you bring in, right, for how mm -hmm. they taste. And so how do you maintain that consistency to deliver the same product time after time? 
Uh, so it's it's a lot of tasting. It's a lot of using um, non traditional tools uh, in winemaking, where we're looking at uh, lots and lots of time on the bench. Uh, as we're bringing in grapes into tanks, we're fermenting them up into single lots. Uh, we're tasting as a group, mm -hmm. identifying, hey, this this has superior quality. Hey, this quality is perfect for this blend and mm. making a lot of streaming decisions. Um, so kind of further down that line, we're talking about, you know, which wines should be racked off their leaves first, which should uh, go to the crossbow filtration mm -hmm. first. And then as a group, we're tasting and saying, okay, these three wines are pointed towards this, this program. These wines are pointed towards this program. Gotcha. Um, you you two winemakers are going to share these two tanks and mm -hmm. all the intricacies that go along with that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and it's interesting to hear you talk about. We work with a lot of the um, we, various wineries and breweries, and you know, a lot of what they speak about leaning into is letting the flavors of that year shine right across the board. Whereas it's it, which is a challenge, and you've got a different challenge to maintain that consistency. So when you say time on the bench, do you mean, help help me understand okay. what that means. So time on the bench, uh, we'll pull samples of every tank that we have um, in large quantities. And then we're there with our beakers, we're there, well, let's try 10% of tank A with 20% of tank B, mm -hmm. and then, oh, let's throw in 50% of tank C. How's that taste? Oh, that tastes pretty close to where we need to go. What does the analysis look like? Is the alcohol in range? Is the sugar at the correct target? So it's a lot of, um, to the outside world, it's the mad scientist part. Yeah. Lots, lots of beakers, lots of flasks, lots yeah. of mixing and tasting. I mean, it's really the exciting part of the work. Yeah. You've got a team of six people going, hey, what if we try this? Mm -hmm. Or I really like that. Let's give it a splash more of this. And kind of really dialing in, you know, what that year looks like. I am fascinated to hear you talk about how much the human element is in that though, right? That you've got, you know, a room full of people that are all tasting to say, my opinion basically as an expert, right? Is that this tastes the closest to the taste profile that we're looking for and that there's no, there's no metric for taste, right? You can't, you can't measure for that. You can measure for the alcohol, you can measure for the sugars, you know, yeah, that kind of thing, but you can't. You know, it's not like, well, it's a it's a 7.3 on the taste scale, you know? Right. So we we do have pretty well-trained palates because yeah. the team is tasting wines every day. Right. And we're making blends to send to the bottling line every day. So a brand like Arbor Mist, you may be tasting Arbor Mist, Blackberry Merlot, you know, three times you know three times in a month mm -hmm, so right you get very used to the profile of what it's supposed to taste like mm -hmm. um, so it's it becomes a well-trained palate to be able to easily pick out minute differences right yeah yeah that's that's so cool now talk about new developments because you you mentioned right. that a bit in terms of grower relations and you know wanting to bring something new to market talk about that a little bit yeah sure um, we actually, uh, in 2023, we had quite the success story with Taylor Port. Um, so Taylor Port is predominantly Concord driven. Um, so we work with our growers to buy up a lot of Concord grapes. Um, through uh, social media and a loyal, uh, loyal following, it kind of really grew explosively. Hmm. So um, through that, we're like, well, since there's a lot of buying power behind Taylor Port now, you know, what, what is the consumer looking for? So we actually launched a line extension called Taylor Port Black, which has richer flavors, darker color, um, and it was all done on the bench. Our winemakers got together, said, you know, hey, here's three different blends that we really like. Uh, I tasted through them and said, yeah, I agree. I like these two out of the three. Uh, we sent those to the West Coast. Uh, my boss on the West Coast said, yeah, this is great. Let's 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 run with this. Mm -hmm. And the other side of that is kind of more 
more doing the work. Mm -hmm. So uh, where I sit in Candegua is the old R&D building for uh, Constellation. Mm -hmm. So there's a beautiful small uh, pilot, pilot winery space in the front office. So we really worked with our corporate counterparts and created a nano winery within the winery. So we have a small destummer, a small bladder press. We have six, six tanks. And last year was really our year one. So we went out and worked with Grow Relations and said, hey, you know, we're trying to target uh, a more, more premium price point. What's out there and is plentiful that we could take a look at? So uh, this past year, we did our first two uh, REC winery lots. Um, mm -hmm. We named it REC for Regional East Coast. So uh, <laughs> we did uh, Cayuga White and Noire, and those lots came out wonderfully. Uh, so now the team of winemakers, uh, they're back at the bench going, well, could we make this a standalone wine? Could we blend this with current portfolio? Mm -hmm. kind of looking at every opportunity there is mm -hmm. uh, just trying to come up with something new and mm -hmm. uh, empowering the team of hey let's keep swinging for the fences all we yeah. need is one home run yeah you know? and so it's a lot of hey i got six wines to taste today great Let, let's taste them yeah. yeah everything from you know drier style whites rosés and reds to uh sangria concepts i tasted mm. three great sangrias this week hmm. so the team is really putting in the work it's, it's yeah it's a fun time to be at the winery yeah so when you find something that that the team likes you like it the team likes it you know it, it's agreed that you think this is worth launching the marketer in me right wants to know what's next so you hinted at yeah. that a little bit in terms <laughs> of like does it sit under an existing portfolio of brands? Do you launch a new brand? Like how does that process work? So um, that's something uh, Candegua is now owned by Ian J. Gallo. So we fall under the corporate umbrella. Mm -hmm. So the corporate umbrella has, has its own set of hurdles to clear before you mm -hmm. can a wine to market. Um, but most of the time we're developing the liquid. So mm -hmm. if we have liquid concepts that we like, uh, I send those to my boss, who's the vice uh, president of wine growing. Mm -hmm. uh, he tastes them. Um, if he agrees that, hey, yeah, I think you guys got something, then we go through and we taste with the brand marketing team. And mm. we get their input. And there are other groups and departments out there that are, you know, monitoring market research. You know, what, de what demographics do we think that this wine will hit? Does it fill in a white space for the company? Mm -hmm. um, so all of those kind of different parties coalesce uh, when everybody agrees, yeah, this is a great wine. Yep. So yep. I just worry about the liquid and yeah. then marketing and sales figures out right. you know, what do they want the package to look like? What do they for want sure. the label to look like? Yep. Who is it for? And all of those yeah, demographic exactly. information. That's very cool. So one of the things that you and I have talked about in the past too, in that vein of grower relations. So um, I know you sit on the board for the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. We just recently won an RFP to survey all the New York State um, grape growers to understand what's in what's in the ground. So I know that that's important for you to understand in terms of what you can bring to market. What do what do your grower relations look like? So uh, I have a very strong team of two that work in grower relations um, and they manage all of New York state and some of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a, approximately 70 different growers throughout New York and Pennsylvania and our grower relations um, person, Mike Kalizzi is fantastic, very knowledgeable, very easy to work with and our grower network loves him. So what I'm talking to Mike about is, hey, um, how much of this variety is planted out there? Because mm -hmm. for different wine styles, there are different th case thresholds mm -hmm. uh, that we need to be able to hit to support growth. Because right. it's great if 
Uh, we find a brand new style and the wine is fantastic, but there's only five acres planted in the ground. I have no room for growth. Right. So it's what's in the ground now. And then we're kind of working with our growers to say, hey, what else do you got? You mm -hmm. know, what's a what's a variety that you want to see go somewhere? Mm -hmm. uh, and after we gain that feedback, we pull some small tons into, well, I should say small poundages. Uh -huh. we'll, we'll ask them to harvest two, 300 pounds in lugs. We pay for the fruit. Mm -hmm. Then we'll crush it through the rec winery mm -hmm. and see how the wines taste. Mm -hmm. So I, I love being out in the field. I love talking to the growers. And every grower has their own passion project, whether it's, hey, I got Aramella or hey, uh, I have five acres planted of Itasca. Have you looked at Itasca? Mm -hmm. um, so that's the exciting part is being in the truck, riding mm -hmm. around, talking to the growers, yeah. walking up and down the vineyard rows, tasting fruit, and then saying, hey, how can we make this happen? Mm -hmm. And then do you, does the winery ever engage directly with those growers to say, let's say that you know, the five acres of something really new and interesting is, is exciting to you. You test it out, you love it, you know, and you want, you need a bunch of it. Do you ever pre like commit with the growers to buy the output of what they put in the ground? Uh, the, we have done that in the past. Mm. Um, so that's what's known as a planting contract. Mm -hmm. So if we find a variety that we really like, we'll say, Hey, um, Typically, we look to our top growers to say, hey, do you have acres to put this in? Mm -hmm. We'll sign you up for a seven, 10-year contract at this price mm -hmm. if you put in this variety and sign those tons to us. Right. Um, we've done that in the past, and it's worked really well. Um, right now, luckily, there's enough of what we're currently buying that we don't need to enter planting contracts, mm -hmm. but it's always something that we look at. Yeah. I think we're, I've started to hear about more of that happening as of late, not just, not, not even really in, in the wine industry, but especially as it relates to regenerative agriculture, because that's something, right, that producers are kind of looking to get their feet wet in that, but they don't want to, you know, it's a chicken and egg kind of scenario, right? Whereas brands want to source regenerative product and, you know, it's a, it's a whole game. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you didn't really come into this work with like a deep interest in winemaking. That was like an itch that you wanted to scratch. You kind of came in from the microbiology angle and then found a fit in winemaking. Correct. I mean, I've always kind of been a fermentation geek. I, you know, before I started at the winery, I brewed my own beer. Gotcha. Um, I've done a lot of, you know, home winemaking, home brewing, uh, I like to tell people if it has sugar in it, I've tried to ferment it. Uh, <laughs> I've tapped my birch tree in the backyard and made birch beer. Oh, cool. The, the micro side has always, always been there. But uh, up until I kind of found the job as wine microbiologist, I had never given winemaking serious thought. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm old enough to where I was a little, you know, before the E&V programs were. Uh -huh. so yeah. So. Yeah. That's great. Um, so we talked about this a little bit briefly. Um, we had Nova Katamatri on season two of Spilled Salt and she shared some great like thoughts about where the future of the industry is going. Any predictions from you? Um, so uh, I think Nova definitely has some interesting thoughts and I agree with some of them. Um, one of the things for us is working in that popular category. Um, mm -hmm. We're focusing on how do we how do we create more wine drinkers? Uh, mm. New wine drinkers don't come into the market buying fifty dollar bottles of Cabernet and thirty five dollar bottles of Riesling. Yeah. Um, so one of Gallo's uh, values is making new friends for wine. So mm -hmm. that has really struck a chord with me and with mm -hmm. Canon Degwa as a site, because that's what we're good at. You know, mm -hmm. how do we, how do we have something for every consumer at every price point? Mm -hmm. So for us, it's that entry level, that $12 and under. 
So mm -hmm. how do we get uh, new consumers in drinking wine? And then as their palates uh, evolve, right? I'm glad. I hope they you know continue on with their wine journey. Mm -hmm. And I hope that they're buying Gala wines. Mm -hmm. um, the other side of that is as we look at um, new wines and making regional wines, we're we're starting to push the envelope and really trying to compete in that $12 to $15 premium section. Uh, I think that there's a space for all, mm -hmm. um, but to, there definitely is a premiumization movement within mm -hmm. the industry uh, that we want to be part of. I think mm -hmm. that there will always be a space for popular wines because that's, that's, that's your hook. That's how you get people into into the market and into drinking wines. Yeah. Well, so I think the future is a bit of both. Mm hmm. Yep. I distinctly remember the first time I walked into a liquor store, you know, when I could legally buy a bottle of wine that I bought barefoot because yeah. I didn't know what I was buying, you know, and I liked the bottle. I thought it was cool. I liked the bright colors and whatever the yellow one is. I think that's Chardonnay perhaps yeah. um, was what I ended up with, you know, but you're right. I think that that's a great, mindset of growing the industry as a whole how can we help people enter into you know the industry in a way that's comfortable for them and making new friends for wine i love that as a tagline you mentioned that premium is 12 to 15 dollars that's a that's a very narrow price it's, point so premium is actually a larger gap i'm saying that i think we can really compete in the 12 to 15 dollar sure. range uh, i mean we are a large site and mm -hmm. have large equipment once you kind of get above that 15 dollar range um our current equipment is a little too strong for the mm. kind of processing we need so i mean mm -hmm. i think we can compete in that 12 to 15 but premium really is kind of 12 to 25 dollar mm, gotcha Gotcha. That makes sense. So I'd love for you to elaborate on that a little bit. You mentioned that you don't really have the equipment for the intricacies of a more super premium, like over, you know, over 25 or let alone over $15 bottle of wine. What does that mean? What does the process look like, you know, to make something on the more sure. super premium side? So uh, I should go back and reset. I think we could make wines above $15, but for us, uh, we, we are a large winery. Right. Uh, right. We'll do six thousand cases, you know, six to seven thousand cases this six sorry, excuse me, six to seven million cases mm -hmm. this year. Um, so and we'll crush anywhere between twenty and twenty six thousand tons of grapes, depending on the year, what the year looks like and what our programs are doing. Mm -hmm. So to do that kind of volume, uh, you have to keep the fruit coming in and you have to keep the equipment moving. Right. So uh, we don't have any bladder presses where we are setting very specific press programs. Mm -hmm. um, we are using more continuous press move, uh, movements. So. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Great. All right, last question for you. Tell me one of your most favorite things about your work, and that can be work that you're doing now or a moment in your career. What comes to mind? Uh, oh, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, favorite things. Uh, I would say kind of right now where I am, uh, being, a, being on the edge of guiding where the Candago winery goes in the next three, five, seven years, mm -hmm. is very exciting. And, you know, seeing the fruit, the quality of fruit that's being grown in New York state, talking to the growers, then really giving the team a chance to stretch their legs and try new things is exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. It gets me up every morning, helps me come in and find excitement every day. So uh, right now, current space uh, is great. I think yeah. I love coming into work. Yeah. I don't know too many people that can say that. I love coming into work too. I'm very passionate about oh. the work that I do. And I love finding other people like you who are, passionate about their work too. I think that for anybody listening to this, life's too short for anything less, right? You yeah. know, to you spend a majority of your of your life at 
your job. And so you should be doing work that you love. Um, but I won't get too existential on that. <laughs> I thought this was an excellent conversation, Matt. Thank you so much for talking a bit about your experience and your journey through winemaking. And I thought it was fascinating. Thanks for taking the time. Yes, thank you. Thank you for listening to Spilled Salt. I'm Maureen Bellatori. For more information about the podcast, visit www.agency-29.com. If you have questions for me or you'd like to recommend a guest for a future episode, you can send a message using the contact form on the website. Like and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode.